Mike, my good friend and co-presenter. Yep. And I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the with the content. Great. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about you know boosting engagement in your virtual meetings. There's a lot of different kinds of virtual meetings. And the room that we're in today has different sections in it that represent those different kinds of all hands meetings, whether recruiting, customer events, or even just networking. And today we're going to tell you some strategies for how to get a high percentage of people engaged, really ready, and really excited to, to, to talk um, with, their, with their colleagues and also receive the content. Um, I'm Ed Stevens. I'm the founder and CEO of Scoot, and I'm here together with Mike Saparito, who is um, going to introduce himself. <laughs> Absolutely. Ed, well, first of all, it's great to, great to be here. Yeah, so it's nice to see everyone. I spend a lot of time in the meeting and learning and development space. In the last couple of years, I've been building out a practice that actually specializes in facilitation, and it's called world-class facilitation. So, Ed, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Mike is being modest. He's, he works with <laughs> a lot of top brands and top companies on how to make their yep. meetings more effective. Uh, we spend yep. a lot of time on meetings. And so, yep. you know, how can we make them more effective? So um, let's jump in. Let's do it. What are we going to do today? Okay. So, well, I mean, you've, you've framed it up. I think first we're going to start with, you know, what's the problem that we're solving for? I mean, we all have meetings and what is the problem if there is one with virtual meetings today? So that's where we're going to start out. But Ed, you know, we can't just start with the problem. We've got to move towards some solutions. So we'll take a look at what are some success practices, some tips, and then we'll even offer up a, a mental model of sorts to help, uh, help think a little bit more holistically about making these impactful experiences for everyone. So that's, that's what's on tap. Okay, what's well, going to be exciting. Make sure you have your pen and paper ready. And um, we're going to jump in, though, to the problem. So, you know, you're here today because um, you caught the um, you know, social media or other emails or other things that we've, we've um, talked about in getting this webinar put together. And, you know, you're here to see, you know, how you can make your meetings better. But what's the problem, right? The problem is right on your screen. It's, it's static rectangles, 90% cameras off. I don't know. Do you ever see this happen, Mike? You know what? Uh, uh, I think the answer I'm supposed to offer up is no, this never happens to me. But the answer is yes, uh, I've seen this. And you know what? More than like remembering it, I remember how it makes me feel, which is not, not all that good. That's right. It's, it's something out there that you know, tells us that people aren't paying attention. And you know, there's actually studies that are being done on this. And you might, you might be or not be surprised to know that 90% of people have reported multitasking during a virtual meeting. So, you know, maybe you decided to come today um, and here we are. We got some great pictures of some guys cooking dinner while they're, while they're uh, participating in one of their company meetings. And that's not good because we're in the intention business. And as we think about the objectives of meeting, we get into the details of that. Um, obviously, you're not going to have a very successful meeting if people are, you know, feeding their dog while you're having your meeting. And furthermore, the speakers, you know, whether it's your CEO or whether it's you or uh, department head, um, we're not getting the kind of feedback that we need because often the, the, you know, the cameras are off, the microphones are off, and it's just hard to know whether or not anybody is paying attention out there. And it makes you feel sad. Isn't that right, Mike? Yeah, it makes you, makes you feel sad. And, and if that's not bad enough, I mean, there's also kind of biological reasons for this. I mean, if you think about how humans for the last you know, tens of thousands of years have learned and interacted and evolved, essentially, it's from, it's from a face-to-face -face interaction. It's picking up those nonverbal cues. There's such rich information that's always flowing in those face-to-face -face interactions. So on some level, you know, the technology uh, has evolved so rapidly, it's almost evolved more rapidly than us humans. So that's why when you go back a few slides to that, to that um, black screen, I mean, it really is fundamentally, you know, viewed as a threat by the brain. So we could probably touch on that more in a little bit. 
Yeah, we definitely will. And then another thing is, you know, what we want, we bring 50 or 100 people together in person, we get this, right? Sidebar yeah. conversations, working the room, introducing yourself to people that you want to know, catching up with old friends. But when we do a virtual meeting, it, it feels like this, just dead, right? You don't get any of that. You show up, you get the content, and then you leave. So even just a few minutes before we started this presentation, I got to meet Rebecca. And Rebecca and I have never met before, but we made a connection. Um, we talked a little bit about the weather in Michigan and Wisconsin. And, um, you know, that was authentic and real. And, um, you know, now I'm up in the presentation and we're doing a content, but that experiential component makes you feel a lot more alive. And so, you know, there is a solution to this. And, you know, we call it social presence. So all of these things, this feedback, networking, the, you know, cameras on, the willingness to integrate with others is taking meetings and bringing into them the social presence that you're, that you're familiar with when you meet in person. So what does that mean? It means you have to be able to move, like you have to have legs so that you can choose the conversations that you're going to be in. And you want to be able to decorate the space so that it feels the way you want everybody to feel. A New Year's Eve party is going to feel different than a sales kickoff, which might feel different than a customer event or a recruiting event. So you have to be able to brand and bring your customers or bring your, bring your employees into a meeting that has an atmosphere. And this all makes your business move faster because the meeting business is the attention business. And if you don't have people's attention, you're not getting your message across. And that's what we're here um, and what you're experiencing today is called Scoot. It's a new type of meeting platform. Now, what we're going to do, though, is we're not going to just talk about Scoot. Mike is an expert meeting facilitator. And the reason we brought him here is because all the things that he's going he's gonna to teach today are things that you can put to work in any type of meeting platform and in any size company. Isn't that right, Mike? Absolutely. I mean, at least in theory, you know, we're all humans. Uh, most of us are working and we want to make a positive impact, positive difference or achieve our goals, however you want to think of it. So if, if we look at it, you know, if you think of big company or small company, if you go to the next slide, I mean, fundamentally, what we're talking about is that meetings, you know, meetings are the same, or at least in theory, they are. I mean, so big company or small, if you look at the slide, you know, a lot of familiar concepts here. I mean, there's a context for the meeting. That is like there's a background or there's objectives or goals. There's people, at least in theory, unless you have empty seats like a few slides earlier. You know, there's people who are willing and able to participate, which in other words is like to engage, which we'll talk about more today. There's process. You know, this shows up in various ways. There could be a, an email that goes out before the meeting. There's a, an agenda during the meeting and such. Uh, there's roles and responsibilities. And then, of course, there's also like, what are we talking about? What content, what data, what visuals, and so on and so forth. And not only do we need the content to have a relevant conversation, in most cases, uh, it needs to be readily available. And then there's also like action, because if we're meeting, and I do say if, because as much as I, I love exploring meetings and how to make them more effective, I always start by, is it even necessary? So if it's not necessary, by the way, don't have the meeting, okay? But assuming it's necessary, you know, how is your meeting geared towards helping people take action? And not random action, goal-oriented action where there's also accountability. Now, to my point, um, you don't always have to meet. But when you do meet, and there's lots of great reasons for meetings, here's the reality. The reality is not all meetings are generating the positive impact that is desired. The way we like to think of it is some meetings, and think about a recent meeting. Think about the meetings you've attended today. You can even think about what you're going through right now, but think about the meetings in general and if they're making you say something like, wow, that was a good use of time. I really got to know so-and-so. I now understand their perspective. We were able to make that decision and we're moving forward. That would be an, an interaction that you'd likely say, wow, I mean, Ed, have, have you been in meetings like that historically a few times? Yeah, I mean, that's what I always look for. 
That's what you look for, right? That's what I look for. And truthfully, if you're a leader in your organization, that's what people crave. What they don't yeah. crave, though, is on the other end of the continuum, right, Ed? I mean, if, if you go like, that oh, was a good meeting or, oh, that was, that was fine. Or, whoa, like, what was that? So yeah, this why, is really, why do, we I mean, do why, why do we even do it? I mean, this is like, in some ways that it's kind of, I feel silly even like saying this, but this tends to be like a helpful model for people to say, okay, where am I currently right now? Absolutely. Okay. So, so, you know, so if, if you think about what we've covered, you know, there's some basic fundamental blocks in meetings. We have a, a wide variety of effectiveness of meetings. But what we do like to do is, is say, like, how do you make your meetings better? So you get that wow impact. Well, it usually starts with the person, the people, the person leading the meeting. So we focus on the human factors. And we don't have a lot of time today to go into all the details. But you can imagine that, you know, to lead an effective meeting, you, you show up differently at different times in that meeting. Sometimes, for example, you are like conducting process. Sometimes you are catalyzing people like to make a decision or to provoke their thinking a little bit. And other times you're, let's say, like problem solving. So there's different modes that you can show up. And this is part of our methodology that we share widely. There's also mindsets and there's other skills that we could look at as well. But the point here is that it starts with the human. It starts with the person. But as Ed and I and, and the team have been talking about over now, it's almost going on two years, I believe, you know, there's one element that is increasingly important as I look, as we look, as, as you look at your ability to have effective meetings in your organization. And it comes down to the, to the tools, to the platforms, and to the environment and what that environment allows. So, Ed, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I, I turn it over to you because people matter, human factors matter, and it's not or, but and the tools and platform matter as well. Yeah, and I think you said it right, environment. That's yeah, the word, yeah. right? It's like, hey, I'm a, hey, team, I'm a, let's go out for a team dinner. Yep. Let's go to McDonald's. Is that an environment that everyone's going to be excited about? I don't know, maybe. Um, yeah. Let's go out to Morton Steakhouse. That would be a different kind of environment. Let's go out and get tacos, Yeah. right? Um, yep. let's, go get, let's go to the coffee shop. Let's go get beers at the brewery. All of yep. those different environments will shape the outcome of your team gathering. And in a virtual platform, you know, certainly on the static kind of rectangles on the screen, you don't have that. And so we're going to have you experience this because the environment and being able to personalize the environment also allows you to personalize the content. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to jump out of the presentation and Mike and I are going to invite you to go find one of these six areas of the room that you're in. You're probably affiliated with one of these types of meetings. Maybe you run the company all hands for the CEO or the Marcom. Maybe you're a recruiter and you're having a hard time getting college students to get excited about your virtual career fairs that are on Zoom. Or you know, maybe you're thinking about hosting customer events. So the room is organized in these six sections. And in that upper left-hand corner, there's the map icon. And when you open the map, in the lower right-hand corner of the mini map, which is a little bit hard to see because it's in white, there's a little square. And if you just click in the lower right-hand corner of the mini map, you'll see the map, it'll blow up even more. And then you will see the full room and you can then click the zoom button and zoom out to see even the full room and see where you're at and then move around. Okay, so in order to provide the personalized experience and the environment, we have to let people move to the part of the room where their content is that they want. And we will have Scoot representatives in each one of these areas sharing a unique client case study for this particular type of meeting. So if you're interested in recruiting and you go to the recruiting area, you'll see recruiting related customer case study. If you go down to customer events, you'll see it there. I'll be up in the all hands area and um, we'll jump out of the presentation mode. We'll just be back here. It'll take about maybe five minutes for you to kind of find the area that you want, meet the scoot individual and um, you know see the case study. And then we'll go ahead and jump back up and 
I think the, there's some exciting things to, to share yet about um, you know, how to actually plan and execute a meeting. So let's go. Let's do it. And now we're back. Okay. So Mike, what were we really experiencing there? You know, you know it's, 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 it's something different, right? Um, it, it is actually. So what, what Daniel and I were chatting about, so I go back to early COVID and when we were going through that whole transition as a culture, as a society, but certainly from a professional standpoint, I truly remember saying, wouldn't it be amazing if like we had breakout tables with people around the table and you could go in the virtual space from one table to the next, like, you know, like we've done for the last 20 years in the, in the physical world and just kind of playing around up in the learning and development space. It's just gratifying to see like how quickly things have evolved where that's actually possible. So Daniel and I were having a little bit of a, like a reflective moment in a mini celebration, oh. I think. Oh, <laughs> so, that's a, that's a, that's you ask, it, it's all true. <laughs> you can ask him. Tear. I just shed a tear. <laughs> there um, you go. Group hug. So, <laughs> so all of you who are here, you know, you're feeling a little bit of a spark. So let's go through and talk a little bit more about some, some, you know, ways that, the platform, the environment actually does make a difference. So movement, you had agency, you had the power to move to the part of the room that you wanted to, and, and maybe you weren't sure which one to go to, but you, you simulate that agency and you can see how if you had a recruiting fair, for example, and you had all your hiring managers and departments organized and you invited students and, and prospective employees to join, that they would be able to go and move and meet the different departments. Um, and you know, because we have the audio proximity and the movement, you can have separate conversations. We shared our screen just in our little groups so we can have personalized content and everyone can be immersed in whatever environment you think is appropriate, fully branded or otherwise. And even some other cool stuff like little buttons that you can click on. Um, so this is just a summary slide of some of the things that you experienced, that group screen share and the, um, the you know, items in the bottom of your screen where you can click and, and, and have a call to action item. And um, even in the upper right, what we call a smart badge, and that's the ability for you to, you know, put specific information in the room for you and for other people to see. And these smart badges, can be, you know, questions. We didn't have any active for the for the webinar today, but you know, you could ask questions on the entry to the room. You could load things up um, with data and present this smart badges to, uh, you know, to the other participants to to have a richer kind of insights into who you're meeting with. Just think of it kind of like LinkedIn on steroids. Um, and and now we're kind of move into the fact that we have this 90 day money back guarantee. So if you're not sure that this kind of immersive environment and you know, dynamic platform can work, you know, we actually have quite a lot of experience in making this happen. And it really does make a difference with companies large and small. Um, icebreakers, Adobe is one of our clients and you know, we have an icebreaker feature, you can break out and you can have people do discussions talk back to the center of the room and use the chat. Um, this is one that is near and dear to my heart. You know, if I was a young associate and I wanted to, um, you know, get something exciting, you know, maybe I could get a second to meet the CEO and I, I can't do that in a Zoom meeting. What do you think about that, Mike? You know what, uh, this, is, this is one of the real big ones for me. So if, if you think about, you know, developing culture, developing people, whether it's a, a, a large or a small organization, I mean, time after time after time, you know, the feedback surveys show that interacting with peers and certainly interacting with, with leaders is, is usually one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable aspect of, let's say, a leadership development program. So the way that I've experienced this in the physical world and now in kind of the scoot world, I think this is super, super important. And, I, and it's, I guess, facilitated by you talk about being able to move. It's something as simple as simulating the movement. Um, this, is a, this is kind of game changing. I love this one. Yeah. If you have 10 groups throughout the room, 
The CEO can pop into the room from wherever yep. she is. Yep. She, she has 10 minutes, 15 minutes on her calendar. She pops in, she hits each one of the groups, says hi, and then pops out. The same way that she would if there was a leadership development program in person and she popped into the conference room and said, hey, um, you know, Leslie, the CEO, welcome. You know, and everyone's like, wow, it's really cool. We got to meet the CEO. Okay, so super powerful. We already talked about branding. Um, this room, we did like an office, but you can do them with products. You can do them with um, seasonal, you know, Christmas decorations. One of my favorite rooms is a, is a baby picture room. Um, I also have a room for our core values that I take all of our new employees through. So building that space. Um, Mike, what do you think about the value of those small group conversations? I mean, again, this is this is like one of those aspects that the way it's now replicated in the virtual space, it's so powerful because even if you think back to your CEO example from just a few moments ago, it's one thing to have like a CEO or a, a small group conversation as this slide speaking to like where you're just in a rectangle and everyone's in a rectangle. But there really is, it's tough for me Ed, to put the words to it, but there's something about the organic nature of like, moving yourself, aggregating together, having the dialogue that just um, is, is just far more natural. That's the best way I can describe it. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And then scale. So whether you're a big company or a small, you know, we've done this for, for big companies, um, huge groups, tiny groups. I was sharing with mine, you know, company of 20 people, IBM, much bigger. So um, we have that 90 day money back guarantee in case you're wondering whether this would work for you. Um, it's easier to make the case. And, um, you know, now Mike's going to take us through his framework for planning a meeting. And I should say this particular part of the meeting will work for any kind of meeting platform, not just for Scoot. And I think it's some of the most valuable content you're going to get just because you have a simple framework for making sure that your meeting is going to be the best it can be. So why don't you take it away from here? And then we got a couple more slides and then we'll jump into Q&A. Awesome, Ed. Yeah, and we'll try, I'll try to add some value here and also make it short and sweet. So making your meeting happen. So if, if you go to the next slide, you know, how do you maximize engagement and impact? In some ways, what I'm going to share with you, it's, it's going to be like almost obvious and it's, it's worth repeating. So step number one, it's around preparation and preparation with intentionality. So if you think back, I was sharing a little bit about, you know, generating impact and not all meetings have the same positive impact that we want. Truth be told, probably 80% of your meeting success is going to land or fall with step one, preparing with intentionality. Number two, then the goal, of course, is to deliver that useful and memorable experience. Now notice it says useful and memorable. So if it said useful and was really boring, it's suboptimal. It's still useful, but it's suboptimal. If it was simply memorable, you had like pom-poms, roller skates, and all sorts of memories created, but there wasn't a lot of utility, you're missing something. So step two is like deliver a useful and memorable experience. I just made that up, Ed, honestly, but hopefully that was memorable. Uh, number three, review what worked and what didn't. So this is the step that high achievers, probably like most of us, often skip. This is the step after the meeting. And I can't the key... Get, I can't get the picture of you on roller skates with pom-poms out of my mind right now. That that is that is um I'm gonna keep moving on. That I don't think I'll bring that one up again. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting visual, isn't it? Yeah. So so step three is around del uh, reviewing what worked and what didn't. And for example, like yeah, my pom poms and roller skates example was memorable, but it may have been too much and it's distracting. That's just a simple example of modeling number three. All right, okay, so let's so break into each of these. Yeah, let's do it. Let's break into each of these. So before your meeting, I'm just going to list some questions to be thinking about. And hint, the questions aren't about you. And truthfully, they're not even about the platform yet. Okay? So who's attending the meeting? What do they want to achieve? What context or awareness or background do they have? Then you want to start thinking about, okay, if, if that's who's attending and what the objective is, like what process are we going to use? How are we going to move forward? How do I envision this meeting fitting in 
to the broader narrative that's already playing out on the project or on the initiative or on the workflow. So before the meeting, you wanna be asking yourself questions about other people, that is the participants. You wanna be asking yourself questions about impact and what you see for the future. Next, let's go to during the meeting. Now, each meeting in the ideal state, you'll be preparing for in advance. And one of the things you'll be preparing for is what we like to call moments of truth. And now this isn't moments of truth in a heavy way, like a solemn or somber. This is like realization, insights, memorability, utility, like moments of truth where you're gonna deliver value or deliver impact or not. And I'm often asked like, hey, like how many moments of truth do you need, Mike? And the answer is there's not any set number. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. You wanna deliver at least one moment of truth one moment of truth in each meeting. If you wanna aim high, you could aim for let's say three moments of truth. Now, what are some other examples of moments of truth? I mean, it could be something as simple yet as impactful as, as data points, visualizations, key questions, key interactions. And it's also good to have kind of a list or a bank account of different moments of truths that you might wanna create during the meeting. Because I remember, for example, it was a, a large fortune, I think with 125 company. It was a high stakes meeting. We went through uh, iter multiple iterations of preparation uh, to eat our own dog food, so to speak. And it turned out that the interaction that we anticipated to be the moment of truth, the first choice didn't even work. It didn't even land the way we thought. And it was the second option, an interaction with the senior executive who, oh, by the way, happened to pop in into the room casually to, to say hello. That was the moment of truth and the conversation that flowed out of that, that made that meeting you know, far from just like fine or good or great. It truly was a wow experience in the minds and in the own words of the executive team from that large organization. So bottom line, during the meeting, create moments of truth. And that all starts with that preparation process where you really wanna win before you begin. Third and finally, this is the step I mentioned before, so I won't belabor it, but I'll simply say, don't skip this step. What went well? Now start with the positive. Start with what you want more of. Why? Because we all have a negativity bias. Our brains are wired to keep us alive. That's a good thing until it's not. Start with the good stuff so you do more of it, then quickly move to lessons learned. Here's the tip. If you're not learning from every meeting that you execute, you're leaving value on the table. And in today's environment, I don't wanna leave any value on the table. I wanna get as much value from every interaction, whether I'm leading the meeting or whether I'm participating within it. So those yeah, are the three steps. Are familiar, I, th I think a lot of us are familiar, even at the end of a session, to kind of do like, a, hey, what worked and what didn't work around the room. Yep. Um, that's a good way to get feedback as well on, you know, kind of closure. And then you can take that, what worked and what didn't work and incorporate it into your, you know, afterwards review with your team that ran the meeting. So um, thanks for all that, Mike. You got um, it. Yeah. And then, you know, um, t just tell us for one second, like what you do for companies out there in case any of our guests sure. today are interested in, you know, kind of up leveling their meetings across the yeah. board. The, the real short answer, we help organizations really drive effectiveness in all of their meetings, whether it's for learning and development, sales enablement, whatever the case may be. How do you equip individuals within your or, own organization to drive maximum impact in these interactions, be it in-person or virtual? So that's where we spend our time at. Yeah, Mike's a real expert in this. Um, okay, so, you know, Scootiverse, which is the room that you're in, Scootiverse, you know, if it's IBM with 1,600 people, yes, it takes more than five minutes to prepare for that meeting. They have four rooms and, you know, lots of hosts and lots of flow and content. But if you're just having a team meeting with 30, 50, 100 people, you can create a Scooterverse in less than five minutes just by clicking one of our standard templates and turning it on and joining the room. So it's as quick as a Zoom meeting if you need it to be or it can be fully customized and designed to meet any purpose for any kind of meeting. So surprising. Um, also easy to measure. Now I, measure, I, I mentioned measurement because you're gonna go and kind of talk to the um, 
oh, we're going to get a new exciting platform to create a new environment to get our cameras on. And somebody's going to ask, well, how are we going to know that this platform is going to do the job? So we're going to measure the cameras on. We're going to measure how many people are talking with each other. Um, we're going to ask people whether they built relationships. So it's easy to measure if you're, if you're, if you're looking to do so. And, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I put on the screen here is just a simple graph that kind of shows how the cameras on typically will increase over the course of a scoot meeting. Sometimes people will join um, sort of expecting it to be a regular meeting. And then before you know it, they are, you know, now actually, um, you know, engaging, realizing, oh, I really wanted to have my camera on. Um, and so, you know, as we see the meeting move forward, you're going to see those cameras on. And, um, you know, that's really kind of the, um, the key to making the whole thing work is measuring and knowing that you're moving forward and you're getting the success level that you're really wanting. Okay. And, so, and, Ed, Ed, real quickly on this one, I, I, I can't, I just can't emphasize enough how important this aspect is, at least when I'm engaging with client partners around demonstrating the impact, demonstrating the value, you know, showing the ROI in a way that's both easy to understand, for example, percentage of cameras on, and I like how now you're show, showing that you can drill into, you know, more detailed or granular data points. So didn't mean to inter interrupt, but like this is critical in this business environment, showing ROI, showing engagement for every single activity. So it's just, it's really relevant. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and just, we're going to take a couple questions here. I see that there yeah. already are some in the chat. Um, okay. So we'll go ahead and, and take them as they come. Uh, the first one I see from Carmen, um, users have the ability to move around the room. Is it possible for admins to assign attendees to specific rooms? Definitely, yes. Um, we have a whole, a whole tool set called Room Entry Flows that allow you to mix and match and put people into the room in the way that you want them to be put into the room and into which rooms. So um, you, know, you start to think about like a seating chart at a, at a formal dinner and you want to have like your team you know, mixed in with some VPs and we can definitely do that. Um, so that's a, that's a great question from Carmen. Any other questions? Let's yeah, I've got else. one. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious, um, just in general, why are cameras on important for engagement? Well, you know, they it's just a proxy so it just tells you kind of where people are and what their minds are it's fully possible that somebody's mm -hmm. camera is off and they are engaged in the meeting we wouldn't know mm -hmm. that but um you know we we kind of flipping that on the other side when it is on we can see that they are there and they are willing and able and interested in in chatting um closed captioning option great question um, the, the answer to that is now, um, you know, most hardware actually has closed captioning built in. So like my Apple computer, um, I can enable it and it will close caption anything um, that plays through my Mac speakers. And I believe Windows has a similar function. So it used to be that closed captioning was something that the video platforms had to have. And now um, it's quite easy to have it enabled right through the hardware itself. So for people who are hard of hearing or who need closed captioning, um, definitely um, that's available, fortunately, now through, through the hardware side of things. Great question. Um, embedding other platforms. Matt, great question. Um, so the, um, the, the easiest way to embed other platforms right now is through a link. So you can link off to another platform using one of our room items. And then when you click that, it will pop open a new tab or a new browser window and from there you can operate any type of application that you want um, we don't have the applications like built into the platform at this time um, but you can link off to them and then collaborate there which gives you a wider range of what you can do but admittedly isn't the same as having it sort of like right in the window um, and then and then if you're just sharing your screen you can use a screen share with your local group in order to um, 
you know, work on something that somebody is sharing and then you can kind of all see it. So if you're like a Google house or a Microsoft house, that's pretty easy to do. Or if you're all on Figma or something like that, that's definitely a good question. And, and real quick, Ed, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the, the room objects. I don't want to kind of geek out on what's possible with those, but certainly from my perspective, if you're listening in and you're, and you're in learning design or experience design for whatever type of meeting, um, Ed, there's a lot of flexibility and opportunity that those, those objects present. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there for those interested in that type of thing. Yeah, it's a terrific way. And, and and we have some room objects in our room. We have some pots of gold around the room. And if you go find all those pots of gold and go ahead and click on it and fill out the form, you can win 100, 100 bucks. So that's just a, a simple way for you to kind of see how a, a, you know, a room item with a link in it can just activate another web page. Um, in order to get you to play with that, we offer the the promise of winning a hundred dollars, which would be pretty good. I think your odds would be pretty good. So um you're definitely better than the Powerball. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um okay. Well, I don't know if we have any other questions. Let's see, maybe we'll pause for if there's one more. Any other questions out there? If not, you oh here's one. Yeah, you mentioned uh a large amount of people admit to multiple multitasking you know how do how do we discourage multitasking during large meetings or all hand meetings well i don't know if anybody's going to like the answer to this but um you actually discouraging multitasking is like chasing your tail the key is put make the meeting you know interesting and relevant enough so that people want to participate well how do you do that we you know personalizing the content is a thing. Like yeah. when you go to Amazon to shop, Amazon gives you a product selection that's based on you, right? The, the reason why people like going to Amazon is because it's a very personalized experience, yeah. okay? When you go into a Walmart, it might be a great place to shop, but they're not personalizing the store for you. So if you think about personalization in tech, um, right now there really isn't much personalization happening in meetings. But we gave a very simplistic example of it today where we had six areas where you could move to based on a type of meeting you might be interested to learn more about. Yep. And any type of personalized content will be much more likely to get people to want to participate because Susie might be interested in benefits information today. Johnny might be interested in hanging out with old friends. And, you know, Leslie might be interested in learning about some of the openings in other departments. Um, how would you deal with that in an all hands meeting? Today, you would run through those sequentially. And by yep. definition, one, you know, only one third of the people would be interested in any one of those sections because you're blasting the same content that you know, half the people don't care about. And you know they don't care about. So if you can take the content that really is for 100% and use that in the general session and say, well, if there's stuff that really is more needs to be personalized, then I can do a breakout. And the breakout can be a lot longer than five minutes like we did today. It can be a 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute breakout, have people sharing that content or have links off. Then your, people are gonna start feeling like, all right, these people get me. I don't care about benefits information today. Way to go, meeting organizer. You have not bored me, you know? And so there's, there's no way you can have somebody listen to benefits information if they're not interested in it that day. Right. So, so you, if you, if you want to have the higher attention levels and have people not multitask, you've got to think seriously about personalization. And there's no way to do that other than, you know, in an all hands meeting, there's no way to do that other than breaking people up into groups. And that's what we would do in person. You know, we would do exactly the same thing in person. We would not um, expect people to just come to a, to a hundred person all hands meeting, sit in their chairs, get the content, and then leave and not talk to anyone. Yeah, that's not what happens. So, and, and, and Ed, one one layer on top of that too. So, when you talk about personalization, I mean, you could argue that the world of like pushing is over, and it's all about pulling people into the conversation, which is exactly what you're saying. Pulling people in the conversation by preparing in a certain way, like you just described, to have the breakouts, and now with the platform, it, it makes it all possible. So, pushing pushing is going to get people to check out and disengage, which is basically why they multitask. 
and, and we just touched a little bit on some of the other personalization aspects like room entry flows where yep. put people in the part of the room already that you think they might be interested in or mix and match them in ways that you already think that might be interesting for them. Um, you know, um, put a badge on them that allows them to find the people that they want to talk to. So, um, you know, with that in mind, I'm just going to go ahead and already we did the Q and A. Um, you can do this. It's you know, 90 day money back guarantee. We can give you the measurements. I'll be in the middle of the room for, you know, the next, you know, 10, 20 minutes, however long. Mike will be in the learning and development section because that's his expertise. And don't forget to go find a pot of gold and put in your name. Um, you have a pretty good chance of winning 100 bucks, And that could be a not too bad way to, to um, finish up a, a webinar. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mike, for joining. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. And um, we will go ahead and just move to the parts of the room and hope to get a chance to meet you. Thanks very much.